Hello everyone, this is Rona Palmer from eMain Enterprises, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this month's Best Practices webinar. And um, I'm always delighted when I have one of our own on the line, uh, and today I have with me Roy Rothwell, who's a senior consultant with the engineering group at eMaint, who works out of our Dublin office uh, that you'll soon note. And he's going to be presenting today's topic, which is visualizing ISO 55000 asset management standards. And uh, Roy, are you with me today? Hello, Rona. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, good morning or good afternoon, depending on <laughs> where our clients are around the globe. And uh, just as a quick introduction about Roy, um, he has been in maintenance management in the software field for over 25 years, working out of our Dublin office and supporting our clients throughout Europe and around the globe. And his specialty is really enterprise asset management with CMMS implementations uh, specifically. And uh, Ryano also helps us with a lot of our validations and works with many of our larger clients who have very unique needs. And he's really, his focus is helping clients achieve a maximum return on the infrastructure of their investment. So that is Roy. And Roy, I was just wondering, we had uh, well over 200 registrants. Um, so while people are logging in, can you just take a moment? And I know ISO and the standard, um, which originated in Europe, is, is kind of new to many of us. And maybe you can take a moment and what prompted you and what inspired you to kind of put this particular presentation together? Yes, Rona. Well, really what's been happening uh, recently is that uh, ISO 55000 is, is gaining some traction, it's gaining some visibility, and uh, we are starting to have prospects and clients reach out to us to get some further information as to how ISO 55000 is potentially going to impact their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so in, within the context of the other standards that are out there, uh, when there's some visibility to a new standard that uh, encroaches in their lives, um, they start picking up the phone and try to seek out some uh, information. So it's something that's been happening over the last year. Great. And, uh, well, we've been we've been we're getting feeling all sorts of requests from uh, all sorts of prospects in relation to the topic. Excellent. Well, we do appreciate you, Roy. You know, taking time to put this together. And to our listeners out there, uh, a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to Roy for the main event is um, your phones are muted uh, because we are recording today's session. This is really going to be an overview or an introduction to the topic and you might want to share it with others on your team. So we'll be sending a link to the recording to all of our uh, attendees today. Um, in addition, Roy has agreed to stay at the end of his presentation, which might take between 30 or 40 minutes, I'm gathering, um, and answer any additional questions you might have. There is also a survey at the end of the presentation, and we want to make sure that we're putting together, there's a lot of effort in, you know, kind of getting guest speakers and putting these together, and we want to make sure we're delivering the kind of information that's important to you. So please let us know how we did and what other topics um, we can bring to you. And one last housekeeping note, because eMain does so many uh, different types of web-based educational sessions, this one is purely on ISO. It's not product training. It's not a product demo. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, just email marketing at eMain if there's a different webinar you were looking for, and we'll give you the schedule for those. So without further ado, Roy, I'm going to turn things over to you to get started. Thank you very much, Rona. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good day, everybody. Good morning, wherever you are in the world. Greetings from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, it's a lovely autumn day here. Uh, we don't get them too often. Um, the topic for discussion today is visualizing ISO 55000. Um, the reason why we've put the word in there is because standards and ISO standards uh, are particularly uh, detailed documents, and there's little or no uh, visualization or diagrams 
in some of those documents. So what we're attempting to do today is to uh, make the actual topic a little bit more uh, visual, uh, and hopefully you'll see that through the uh, the various screens that I'll be presenting today. Um, we've got prospects and clients now in our world who are connecting with us to try to find out what's the connection between ISO 55000 and CMMS. Uh, and ISO 55000 is, uh, is starting to make its way into the world of asset management, uh, particularly in Europe and also in the US. Myself, I've been involved in this business since 1989 uh, in the world of enterprise asset management and computerized maintenance management software. It's something that I've been involved with, in, with many clients in many different sectors. In relation to the agenda uh, for today, these are the high-level items that we're going to have a look at. Uh, we'll have a look at why ISO 55000 is so important to me and to my world. Uh, we'll have a look at some of the terms that we're uh, dealing with in this business. Uh, why is ISO 55000 so important? Uh, some of you on the line might have been uh, familiar with the PAS 55 uh, system or standard, how it's transitioned to ISO 55000. Uh, then we'll have a look at the components of ISO 55000. Uh, there are three components, 55000, 55001, and 55002. Uh, we'll have three poll questions as we move along, and uh, we'll have some Q&A at the end. So, ISO 55000 and me. Well, as I mentioned, I've been involved in this business since 1989. Uh, essentially, back in the early 90s, I was involved with uh, a couple of different businesses in the asset and reliability world. Uh, I met uh, a gentleman known as John Mowbray. Uh, he, he was involved in Reliability Center of Maintenance, and, uh, and John had a company called the Aladon Network, and a company I worked with at the time partnered with the Aladon Network, and we partnered up with John. So my interest in Reliability Center of Maintenance came from, from there. Uh, John Woodhouse. Uh, worked in the same company as me as well. Uh, and John has gone on to set up many businesses uh, over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and John's background uh, has also been in asset liability. Uh, John became involved in the definition of the PAS standard uh, and subsequently got involved in the development of the ISO 55 uh, standard as well. Myself and John, we worked together uh, in a company uh, out of the oil and gas business in Norway called the Kaverner Group. So that was back in the 1970s, 19, uh, 1989 to, to 1994. So that's ISO 55000 and me, the, the little bit of history there. We've got a poll coming up, uh, Rona, so if I can just hand it over to you to, to kick off the poll uh, and let's see uh, where the, uh, the feedback is in terms of our, our audience today. Great. All right. Well, um, we're opening the first of three poll questions, and uh, we always like to get a feel for what our, who's on the line with us today. These are just anonymous. But Roy is asking, how would you best describe your current understanding of ISO 55000? Some of you may have a good understanding, but just are just here for an update. Maybe you're in number two. You've heard of it, but you're not exactly sure if it how it benefits me or if it benefits me. and Or number three, you're on the line, you've never heard of it, but so you're interested in learning more. All right, so it looks like you, we've gotten about, we'll leave this about 85% in, leave it open for a few seconds. And by the way, um, though the phones are muted, if you have questions, please type them at any time and we'll read them to Roy at the conclusion of the session. All right, let me close these and share the results. and. Roy, it looks at like 11% of our listeners today have a good understanding, so perhaps they're just seeing if maybe you can add a few tidbits in your presentation today. 44% have heard of ISO 55000 but are not sure of the benefit. And then another 44% saying they haven't heard of it, so they'd like to get an introduction. All right, back to you, Roy. I'll turn the slides to you. Excellent, Rona. Thank you very much for that. So thank you very much, folks, for participating in that. It gives me a, a good flavor of uh, where we are today. Um, so let me move along and uh, 
open up uh, some of the the uh, information that we got going on and try to help to raise the cloud of the some of the definitions around this particular activity. So as I was preparing the, the material here, um, I started looking at the standards and there are lots and lots of terms and references um, in the world of asset management that uh, we need to be aware of. So uh, the terms that I've got here in this word cloud uh, are what's in play currently in asset management. And uh, they are the topics that uh, the standard of ISO 55000 is trying to help clarify. So as we go through the materials, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of some of the, the key phrases and terms. But uh, there's a, a world of confusion and ambiguity uh, in the world of asset management, and all of these phrases and terms play into that. So how does ISO 55000 play into this? Well, what is it? Well, it's a standard, uh, just like uh, ISO 9000 or any of the other ISO standards that are out there. Uh, it refers ultimately to a series of three documents, uh, ISO 55000, 55001, and 55002. Uh, it represents current good practice in relation to asset management. Uh, it contains guidance on the list that's there. Uh, the organization, uh, the leadership within the organization, planning activity, support activities, operational activities, the evaluation uh, of performance, and uh, continuous improvement. A little bit more is that international cooperation in the preparation of the standards has identified common practices that can be applied to the broadest range of assets in the broadest range of organizations across the broadest range of cultures. So that's a direct quote from the standard. Uh, ultimately, uh, what it's trying to say is that there's some consensus now around what this particular business is all around and uh, helps to bring a common language to the business of asset management. Why is it so important? Well. Essentially, uh, it's important because it brings the business of asset management into the boardroom, uh, just like the other standards like ISO 9000 or ISO 14000 for environmental or ISO 5001 for energy and so on. So it's an international standard. Uh, it brings the actual uh, business of asset management into the boardroom. A key element is that it brings this line of sight between the boardroom and tactical operations, between the guys in the boardroom and the guys with the wrenches and screwdrivers actually carrying out operations and maintenance and reliability type work. It creates a culture of continuous improvement and recognizes asset management ultimately as a discipline. Uh, it raises awareness about asset management in life cycle terms. So considering the, the life of an asset from uh, conception through to design to construction uh, through to sustaining. Uh, it also looks at uh, asset management and helps to break down the organizational silos within an organization. And ultimately, just like uh, some of the other standards, the uh, ISO 55000 will become a prerequisite for doing business. What are the benefits? Well, the benefits uh, are listed here. Uh, essentially, uh, we're looking at improving risk. Uh, we're looking at improving finances. We're looking at improving efficiencies. We're looking at improving uh, reputation. We're looking at improving compliance, social responsibility, uh, efficiencies and effectiveness. Lots and lots of reasons why organizations will go about implementing uh, ISO 55000. Um, and some of these items are going to play in your world uh, and you're going to uh, accrue the benefits from the implementation of ISO 55000 as a result of uh, going through the exercise. Who's interested in this topic? Well, those considering how to improve uh, their asset base uh, in their organization. Um, those involved in the establishment and the implementation of maintenance and improvement programs across their asset management system, uh, and those involved in the planning and design and implementation uh, of asset management activities, uh, including uh, service providers uh, external potentially to your organization. 
regulators are going to be interested in what's going on and they're going to be interested in ISO 55000. So there are many marketplaces around the world where governments and regulatory authorities mandate or strongly encourage the adoption of ISO standards. So places where uh, this is the case, uh, the uptake uh, is slow, but it's starting to grow. Uh, and the impact is likely to take some time. Uh, just like any of the other standards, uh, it takes time to uh, educate, communicate, uh, and implement. And, uh, and as we see some maturity in this area, uh, we'll see organizations flourishing as a result of the implementation of the standard. Some of you may be familiar with the uh, PAS 55 publicly available specification. Um, so PAS 55 originated uh, in the UK around about 2002, 2003, 2004, uh, driven by the Institute of Asset Management in conjunction with the British standards in the UK. Um, it was the first publicly available standard for the optimization of asset management. So uh, if you like, it was the, uh, the, the ground stones upon which ISO 55000 grew. Uh, it had widespread adoption uh, throughout the UK uh, and across various uh, silos, utilities, transport, mining, uh, manufacturing, and so on. Uh, in 2008, it was updated, and uh, it was developed by up to 50 different organizations from 15 different industry sectors, and it started to see uh, a growing appeal uh, outside of the UK, across 10 countries in particular. From there, uh, the next step for, for PASS 55 was to bring uh, a standard into the ISO world uh, to, to make it a uh, an absolutely a global standard for the implementation of asset management best practices uh, around the world. Uh, and in, to, in um, 2014, uh, the International Standard uh, for Asset Management uh, was born. PAS 55 uh, looks like, or did look like, the, the triangle uh, image I've got on the screen there. Uh, looking at the, the various elements of the business of asset management uh, from the ground up, uh, but didn't necessarily take into account uh, the line of sight from the, the corporate organizational management perspective. Uh, it certainly looked at the asset management portfolios, it looked at the asset management systems, and it looked at the life cycle of assets from cradle to grave. Uh, there, there is some argument around the life of a, a typical asset, some might say it's 70 odd years. The initial years are around design, construction, uh, installation, and then the other 67 years are typically around sustainability. So the, the areas to the right hand side there in terms of utilization, maintenance, and disposal is what fits into that sort of life cycle uh, of an asset. PAS 55 um, provided organizations with a, a methodology for assessing the maturity of their asset management system within their world. And you can see here, uh, you know, the key topics uh, within a checklist uh, down the left-hand side here. Uh, the key areas uh, where an organization uh, could be assessed uh, in relation to their maturity uh, in regards to asset management and asset management systems. Visuals in this regard uh, are the radar type graph that's being presented there uh, that shows where an organization is potentially uh, in terms of the, the maturity of the model. Um, there was about 121 questions uh, across that particular methodology uh, and it focused on those areas uh, that are identified there. Uh, it was a great method and is a great method for helping identify what gaps there are and what gaps there needs to be closed uh, in relation to the asset management system uh, within most organizations. That's now been followed on uh, within the ISO 55000 world. Uh, a very similar methodology uh, and a very similar tools uh, in play. Uh, looking uh, at particularly uh, seven different sections, seven different elements, uh, and it's been reduced down to 39 questions. Uh, 
but the general areas of consideration uh, are still the same. So we'll go through the details of what those particular sections are uh, over the next few slides. ISO 55000, as I say, is made up of three components. Uh, 55000 itself provides an overview of the principles, the concepts, and the terminology relating to asset management. 55001 uh, defines the requirements, uh, and 55002 provides guidance. We're going to have a quick look here at 55000 uh, and just talk through the, the, the key elements that are going on within that particular section of the standard. And as I mentioned before, uh, definitions, terminology are, are very important. Uh, so uh, like most standards, definitions are, are up front. Uh, and the terms that I've got here on the screen uh, give a flavor of the topics that are in play there. Um, there are in no particular order. The words that are bigger than others uh, are, make no real significance. Um, but we can look at things like process management, asset life, strategic asset performance, asset management, organization objective, conformity, organizational plans. So all of these definitions are outlined uh, in the standard uh, and help form the, the foundations for the actual standard in terms of clarity. Asset management uh, has got a number of relationships built into it, and these are outlined in the standard up front uh, in 5000. We're looking at the asset portfolio uh, within the scope of the system. We're looking at the asset management system, which is a set of interrelated elements, and looking at asset management as a business, which is a coordinated activity to realize value from assets. Another visual to give a perspective of uh, asset management systems uh, is on this slide here where we see a strategic asset management plan as being core to the implementation of a, a standard uh, in the context of having some policies, having plans, uh, and having a closed loop uh, at the left-hand side there between the various elements. Uh, so asset management plans, the implementation of plans, the asset portfolio, and at the bottom, performance evaluation and improvements in relation to the whole context of asset management. What's important is to close what's called the line of sight between the stakeholder and the organizational context with what's going on on the ground. So the line of sight is a term that's used uh, particularly in the context of ISO 5000, where we have connectivity between the boardroom uh, through to policies, through to plans, through to a strategy, departmental objectives, the planning of work, and the actual execution of work on the ground by technicians and operations guys out in the field. So the line of sight is something that's uh, very important uh, in the context of ISO 55000. The, the meat of ISO 55000 is within the requirements, uh, and that's section two. It's known as ISO 55001. It defines the requirements for establishing, implementing, and maintaining, and improving the management system for asset management. Uh, it serves as the framework for the development and the basis for certification. The visual for this uh, is based on the Deming uh, PDCA model, uh, Plan, Do, Check, Act. I'm sure most of you on the line will be familiar with uh, the Deming model, uh, and it's being used within the context of ISO 55000 and was also used in the context of PAS 55. So we're dealing with the organizational context, and most of you on the line will be coming from different organizations with different perspectives uh, and different silos and different businesses. So we'll be looking uh, in the context of ISO 55001, uh, we'll be looking at leadership, we'll be looking at planning, operations, performance evaluation, improvement, and the support, uh, all within the context of the implementation of asset management within an organization. The first section 
deals with uh, the content. The first section that is of, uh, of any real value uh, within ISO 55001 is going to be section four. The, the first three sections, one, two, and three, are introductory sections. So um, they, they don't take up too much reading. It's about half a page. Uh, moving on then to section four, is, it's pretty high level as well. Uh, it relates to your organizational context. Um, it talks to having a strategic asset management plan in place. It talks to ensuring that we know who the stakeholders are involved uh, and what the needs of the stakeholders are and what they should be. It also looks at the scope uh, and what's in the scope of the asset management system and then defining and documenting the asset management system. So section four looks at these items from an organizational perspective, uh, and particularly looking at the strategic asset management plan. Section five in 5000 and, uh, 55001 uh, talks to leadership. Uh, it's looking at how leadership is involved in the strategic management of assets within your organization. Uh, when reading the, the standard, it becomes very obvious that gaining compliance within this uh, standard uh, is necessary from a top-down perspective uh, and those responsible for, for setting the strategic direction for the organization. So those in the boardroom, those at leadership level, uh, now starting to take an interest and in, uh, taking some responsibility. Uh, the standard forces alignment between the, the business strategy at a high level and the assets abilities to carry out that strategy and the technical activities that ensures that the asset can continue to carry out that strategy. Uh, and the organization must have the required level of discipline to, uh, to do the right things, the little things and that are necessary to maintain the line of sight that I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the top management is responsible for creating a culture that maintains this discipline. So section five is all around leadership and their commitment and the commitment to the strategic asset management plan and putting in place the most uh, and authorities to make that happen. In relation to organizational context and planning, section six deals with planning. Uh, it deals with the, the details of the strategic asset management plan. Uh, that have been developed uh, and the principles outlined within it. It deals with the policies that are associated with asset management uh, in the organization. It deals with each asset specifically at the business unit level, at the plant level, at the system level, and at the individual asset level, all covered in the context of an asset management plan. And it defines how that asset is to be managed over its entire life cycle. So we're now starting to talk about assets, preventive maintenance schedules, uh, and maintenance routine, maintenance management schedule, uh, activity. This topic also considers the regulatory requirements and the environmental influences that might be present within your organization. It spells out the desired level of service and the actions required to maintain the level of service. It also gives details of the capital and operating costs necessary to maintain the level of service so that the life cycle costs of the asset will be understood. And again, it maintains the line of sight to the organizational goals and vision. Section seven is in relation to the support elements of the implementation of the standard. It's looking at the resources, the resourcing plan that have been developed to address any gaps uh, where there might be some financial or human uh, gaps in play. Uh, gap analysis in relation to the competencies required, in relation to the skills and expertise required. Focus on responsibilities and the accountabilities uh, that could have an impact on the system. Uh, and we'll understand their roles and be provided in support, training, education, in order for the folks involved to be able to execute their duties effectively. And in the event of any responsibilities that are outsourced to external providers, that these activities are, are fully understood and that any competency gaps uh, within that world are closed. A communication plan to uh, ensure that everybody is in the loop, uh, that that communication plan 
uh, the appropriate methods and media are in place, the frequency of communication uh, are all in play. And it also builds on the human awareness and about the potential risks associated with the implementation of the asset management plan. Section 8 is around operations. We're looking at operational planning and control, the management of change and outsourcing contractors. So processes that are in place for to manage all of this, that define how the different elements of the asset management system are to be executed and to ensure all people understand their role in making the process work. We're looking at performance measures. We're looking at how that is put into place and how folks are functioning uh, and if there are any warning signs or KPIs in relation to performance. A change management process that's in place, similar to uh, ISO 9000, that requires any scrutiny of proposed changes to identify and mitigate any potential negative consequences. And in the event that a change to an asset is made, that all related information is updated to ensure accuracy. And the processes are in place for governance, uh, again, of outsourced activity to include performance monitoring, data capture, information exchange, and regular management review. Section 9 is around monitoring, measurement, evaluation, auditing, and management review. That the organization continually monitors and performs uh, performance of the asset uh, system through the use of uh, performance measures, internal and external, uh, and regular management review. Uh, it's done to ensure that the asset management system and policy continue to align with the business goals, uh, the assets and the asset management system are functioning as intended, and the risks presented by the assets are within the organization's risk tolerance. And finally, Section 10. It talks to improvement, continuous improvement. So the elements that come into play here are any non-conformities or corrective actions that come into play, preventive actions, uh, and continuous improvement. So any problems or non-conformities that are identified uh, through the reviews are resolved uh, in a formal corrective action system. Uh, that organization practices continually improve by reviewing asset management plans, maybe benchmarking other organizations, attending trade shows, conferences, uh, and consulting with suppliers uh, and, and customers. So that's section two, uh, which is known as ISO 55001. Uh, it's got to do with the actual uh, implementation uh, of ISO 55000 and the requirements required there. The next section, uh, and to me the most important section, which is the section called uh, ISO 55000. 2002. Uh, it provides guidance and explanatory notes on the requirements uh, in the second section, which is 55001. And, and for me, as I say, it's the most useful section. Uh, it gives some guidance as to what an organization should do and how to do it. Uh, and there are lots and lots of should statements within that section. Should statements around how an organization should go about setting up uh, and follow what's happened in section four around the, the context of the organization. Uh, leadership uh, in section five, section six around planning, section seven around support, section eight around operations, section nine around performance evaluation, and section 10 around improvement. So it's the implementation guidance uh, in order for it to go about implementing uh, 55,001. So, having gone through all of that, what does an ISO 55000 compliant organization look like? Well, it starts to look like an organization that has a clear understanding of how their assets enable them to attain the mission and goals of the organization. Uh, it provides ownership and a level of accountability for asset management from the top down. The organization starts to view asset management at the same level as, of importance as any of the other international standards that are out there around environmental or quality or energy. And it ensures that the function of asset management and the operation of asset management systems are aligned with all other organizational functions. And that the organization will have a clear understanding of the risks and opportunities 
presented by the assets. So bottom line is that ownership and accountability uh, for asset management, it remains a top level priority. Uh, and from there, there's continuous demonstration that leadership traits uh, are in play uh, and that are necessary for effective asset management. Time for another poll question, Rona. Uh, over to you. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to launch our next poll question. And that question that Roy is asking is, how important is your CMMS currently in your asset management program? And um, again, that will kind of tell us, now we're going to show how the standard that he's talked about relates to CMMS. And maybe you can tell us today that your CMMS is very important, somewhat important, not important, or perhaps to have a system currently, um, but are gathering information today. All right, so we've gotten about 70% of the votes in. Let me leave this open for a few more seconds. Um, all right, let me go ahead and share the results. And uh, Roy, what it looks like our listeners are telling us, over, over half, 54%, say it's very important. About a quarter or 25% say somewhat important. We didn't have anybody say it's not important. I guess that's a, that's a good thing in our world. And 23% uh, or nearly a quarter saying they don't have a system in there. All right. So I'm going to turn that back to you. Thank you very much, Rona. So uh, I'm del delighted that uh, folks in the line see a connection between asset management systems and ISO 55000 and uh, CMMS. Uh, it's the world we're operating in. Uh, from my perspective, um, uh, the connection between the business uh, and the implementation of a CMMS um, is very, very uh, keen to the way we do business. Uh, we do find that we have clients uh, who feel that the implementation of a CMMS is a magic wand. Uh, in this case, the implementation of a CMMS uh, within the context of ISO 55000 uh, is a key element to the jigsaw, uh, so it's a key element in uh, improving asset management, uh, taking the term maintenance management out of our vocabulary uh, and a strategic view to the uh, implementation of asset management and CMMS uh, in the context of improving whatever those KPIs uh, that you're targeting to improve, whether it be safety, security, environmental, reliability, productivity, uh, or financial. So uh, a key connection between the CMMS program, uh, the implementation of ISO 55000 uh, to improve your, your bottom line. Following on a little bit to some examples of organizations that have achieved success uh, as a result of uh, accreditation in the world uh, of ISO 55000. Uh, we've got two examples here. The first one uh, is Transco. Uh, they're located in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's a large uh, utility organization uh, and uh, they've achieved ISO 55000 certification. Uh, and they say that achieving this accreditation will support their vision uh, of being a leading international provider of transmission services for potable water and electricity. Uh, this accreditation placed Transco in the ranks of the global companies with the highest international standards in asset management. So this organization uh, are competing uh, in the global market and uh, are finding that as a result of being ISO 55000 uh, certified that it's going to assist them in, in growing their business. Uh, so uh, from the, the Jacobs Engineering Group, uh, they're saying that Transco clearly demonstrates a culture of continuous improvement, continually work, looking at new and innovative approaches to the way it manages its assets. So the, uh, the Jacobs uh, Engineering Group uh, and an endorsed uh, assessor by the Institute of Asset Management, uh, that organization. So Transco obviously gaining some traction uh, and gaining a business benefit as a result of uh, ISO 55000 in a, a global marketplace. 
The next example of a case study we've got here is SGC. Uh, they're in the UK uh, and they've been also uh, accredited uh, for the section 55001. Um, this organization has competencies in inspection, verification, testing um, and are being continuously that are being continuously approved upon and are, are considered to be best in class. Uh, they've certified a number of organizations covering diverse assets from airports to road networks to power generation and also the oil and gas world. Uh, it's also for them relevant for service companies who operate assets on, on behalf of an owner. Uh, so SGS now certified these organizations as well. Uh, their accreditation provides confidence that operators are acting as the custodian of the assets using the 55001 framework and acts as a marketing tool when the operator is looking to operate in new sectors. So the, the clients of SGS uh, are taking advantage of 55000 in order for them to be able to use the standard to help them gain a further foothold uh, in the markets within which they're operating. So we've got a final poll now, Rona. So if I could just pass it over to you again. Okay. So our last question of our listeners today. Can you tell us what is your biggest challenge in your asset management journey? And today, uh, you know, Roy provided a lot of details about what this standard or framework, um, how it can benefit you, but we would just like to know where you are today in this journey. And again, answers are kept anonymous. Uh, so just please let us know how you characterize where you are in this cycle. All right, and uh, another question that has come up um, is people are asking if we'll be sending out a copy of today's presentation. And I want to reassure you guys that we'll, we'll send both a link to a PDF of our slides, as well as a link to the recording, so you can uh, further share this with others in your on your team. All right, it looks like just about everybody has weighed in, so let me share the results with you. Um, so, 23% Roy are saying leadership buy-in is a challenge. Nearly half, this is interesting. Nearly half, or 47%, are saying culture change. 15% say it's resources, 8% say systems, and then another 8% say other priorities. All right, back to you, Roy. Thank you very much, Rona. So um, there are no surprises uh, in the results of that poll. Um, this is strategic. Uh, in terms of the implementation of a, a system like this uh, and a standard like this. So leadership and culture, uh, it's not a surprise that those are uh, the, the key challenges uh, in terms of the feedback there from our, our audience today. So this whole topic, uh, it's a new topic. It's something that's uh, only come to the table since uh, the springtime in 2014. Um, it's starting to gain a little bit of momentum uh, and we're doing our best to uh, educate and inform. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that uh, has got a lot of weight and a lot of meat in it uh, and we're going to, to bring some further clarity to that particular topic uh, in the, uh, our Accelerate conference which is uh, happening at the end of October uh, in Florida. <clears throat> Um, the Institute of Asset Management, who uh, are the drivers behind the ISO 55000, uh, they've also got some very, very useful material to help uh, help educate and inform on the topic uh, of ISO 55000 and other related asset management uh, activities. Uh, at Accelerate, uh, I'll be presenting a topic called Big Picture, uh, and the Big Picture uh, is a novel approach to uh, presenting information around asset management and in uh, ISO 55000. Uh, it talks about the journey of asset management uh, and it's a tool to help start in conversations around asset management within your organization uh, and as well as suppliers, your customers and, and wider stakeholders. 
So the intention is to capture what it feels like depicting the cultural as well as the technical barriers. So the presentation that uh, I'll be putting together for Accelerate uh, is going to be broken down to uh, a number of different videos. Uh, we will have some breakouts. We will have some feedback from uh, the folks in the room. Uh, and we will wrap it up by having some clarity around what the big picture is in relation to asset management, uh, how we can deal with costs, risks, performance, collective decision making, speaking the same language, continuous improvement, adding value, the impact to the bottom line, and all of this in the context of ISO 55000 and the benefits that the standard like that can bring to the world of asset management. Just a final uh, plug, and maybe I can hand this one back over to uh, you, Rona. Uh, it's got to do with Accelerate, and maybe you can take it back. Sure. Well, for those, uh, Roy did allude to uh, the annual conference. For those of you that are email, list, uh, email clients on the line, at our annual user conference, we will have a track devoted uh, to various reliability best practices, and there will be a session um, or two pertaining to this standard and a couple of classes, as um, Roy has alluded to. So those of you who are attending, uh, if you need more information, please reach out to me or just marketing at eMaint, and we'd be happy to get you more information about our annual conference. It's at near our headquarters in Florida. It's coming up next month. It coincides with a new introduction and training on the latest version of our software, but there are also um, is a track devoted to this type of topic in maintenance and reliability best practices. Huh. All right, good enough. Thank you, Rona. So just one final piece uh, on this topic. If there's uh, anybody on the line looking for further information in terms of uh, how to get your hands on the standard, uh, these four uh, key organizations can assist uh, Institute of Asset Management, uh, the BSI group, of course ISO and uh, Reliability Web as well. So any of those organizations uh, can help you uh, get to the bottom of the standard and some of those organizations uh, uh, allow you to, to purchase. And that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Rona and uh, the folks on the line. Uh, I think we're available now for uh, for some questions. Q and A, absolutely. And gosh, people have been pretty busy here, Roy. So uh, I'll try to talk fast and get to as many as we possibly can um, before the top of the hour. Uh, someone is asking, Roy. Um, how mature do you feel an organization needs to be in terms of their maintenance management before embarking on this type of journey? If the organization is still largely in a reactive mode or in breakdown maintenance mode, should it be out of this mode before pursuing ISO? Or can those two things run in parallel, in your opinion and experience? So uh, the the, the topic covers uh, the practicality of, of preventive maintenance management and reactive maintenance management. But the detail is there, and the detail around that has come from uh, PAS uh, 55 as well. So the maturity is taking what we had uh, in the past up to into the boardroom level. So when we're looking at the, the particular foil that I've got there, uh, we're looking at having strategic plans in place. We're having a look at ensuring that there's somebody in the boardroom who's got a strategic eye as to the asset portfolio uh, that's in play. Uh, definitions around what the asset is, you know, the assets can be the, uh, the fabric of an organization. It could be the fabric of a $10 billion organization. That could be the portfolio of assets. Um, it could be down to the, the physical items of equipment that the technicians are, are uh, interacting with uh, on a daily basis. So a strategic eye on the asset portfolio uh, is where we're looking here so that it brings a strategic approach to the management of the asset. So closing the gap 
the line of sight between the, the boardroom and operations. So if we're operating in a reactive mode, uh, then we're operating um, at a level of maturity in terms of the standard uh, that's pretty low. Uh, we need to be at a place where we're looking more around proactive measures, preventive measures, uh, condition monitoring. Uh, so these are strategies uh, that will help uh, from a maintenance perspective. Uh, but we're, we're really reaching here to, to bring uh, the topic uh, up the ladder, uh, up into uh, from a tactical perspective to a strategic perspective and into uh, into leadership boardroom. Perfect. On a related note, uh, another listener was asking if it might help close communication gaps across departments by everyone um, aligning to a common objective. Absolutely. Agree absolutely. With that? absolutely. And absolutely. So, um, in fact, uh, some of the sections there specifically relate to uh, communications. Um, so communications is a key part of the, the standard uh, to ensure that there is regular, uh, uh, frequent uh, communications in the various media. It's, 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 it's pretty irrelevant, the media, but uh, that there is, again, uh, a, a light put on what's going on from the asset portfolio perspective uh, and that we have a plan, uh, and that we are rolling out the plan and communicating the plan, and uh, that that plan is being communicated on a regular basis, uh, and any course corrections are being communicated to the appropriate uh, stakeholders involved. So if, again, right across the board, from the guys with the wrench and screwdriver uh, to the guys with the the actual uh, concerns in relation to performance, risk, uh, and strategy uh, up the ladder. Great. And someone, uh, one listener is asking today, what industries is this most relevant to? Or is there any, is it more relevant for utilities, infrastructure, healthcare, manufacturing, universities, or, you know, is it perhaps you can shed some light on who the Yes, indeed. Is? I'm just going to go back to a, a quote uh, from the okay. standard. So international cooperation in the preparation of these standards has identified common practices that can be applied to the broadest range of assets, in the broadest range of organizations, across the broadest range of cultures. So, of course, uh, you know, it's quite a wide net. Um, specifically to answer the question is that uh, we are seeing that ISO 55000 is, um, is being implemented across many different cultures. Uh, many different organizations, many different verticals, um, so it is broad. Um, it would have come and originated, uh, like PAS 55, it would have originated from, you know, the, 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 the oil and gas business, uh, regulated organizations, uh, organizations like the FDA regulated organizations, uh, but as I say, um, it's asset intensive organizations uh, with a uh, high um, capital investment uh, in their assets. Okay, and did, in, did you come across, Roy, in your readings, is there a, a related question was, is there a certain value to asset dollars for those who would be best suited to really embrace this or really should be embracing it? The answer, the answer to that is no. Uh, there is no specific uh, financial um, number that was put out there. Uh, so I, I, I suppose uh, then again, it, it, it comes down to how significant uh, is the asset portfolio within your organization uh, and uh, are you taking a strategic approach to the life cycle uh, of those assets? So in terms of the, the design, the, the commissioning, the installation, the uh, actual operation, the sustainability, and then the the uh, end of life of those assets or those specific assets, based on uh, the criticality of the assets that you've got, the risk that you'll take uh, if those assets are, are uh, unavailable, uh, the financial implications of their unavailability, and so on. So, it's it comes down ultimately to the organisation and the risk that they will take to the uh, assets not being uh, in the shape they should be. 
Okay, I think we did have um, someone else, uh, again, just a related question, Roy, is as to briefly explain the importance of the risk management element of ISO. So perhaps you could reiterate that. Okay, so the uh, let me just get to an appropriate file to, 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 take, this, to take this up. So, risk management uh, in terms of the line of sight uh, is identified here uh, from every level. Uh, when it comes to um, the topic of, I guess what we're most aware of uh, is the unavailability of a piece of equipment as a result of uh, some failure. Um, unplanned failures, the impact and the cost associated with that. So, uh, in my days as a reliability-centered maintenance practitioner, um, risk was a, a, a key topic. The risk comes down to the definition of an organization uh, in terms of what risk will they take uh, if a piece of equipment is not available, what's the cost of that risk, what are the implications. So, the, the implications of uh, an asset uh, on the ground not being available uh, comes into play everywhere here, so that the fact that we're just maintaining a piece of equipment uh, because it's unavailable needs to make its way uh, known up the ladder, up to the uh, strategic position within the organization. So the impact uh, of the unavailability of a critical piece of equipment is obviously going to be uh, significant in an organization. Uh, the unavailability of a l lower priority or a less critical piece of equipment is going to be obviously less important. So carrying out risk assessments, identifying the criticality of your assets, working out the importance of what work is to be done in a proactive manner uh, to ensure that you've got healthier assets, uh, less pain uh, will ultimately result uh, in less risk. Perfect. I think we have time for one more question. Um, for companies, uh, so a listener is asking, can this be embraced at a plant level or does it have to happen the enterprise as a whole uh, when you embrace and, and seek compliance with a standard such as this? It, it can be at, uh, at the plant level. Uh, most definitely, and, uh, and what we'll find is we'll find that for an enterprise uh, organization, a corporation that has got many physical locations, um, the actual standard uh, uh, being uh, implemented uh, at a single site as a pilot uh, is something that we're, we're noticing. So certainly a plant level, yes, uh, lessons learned uh, from a plant or from a site, uh, and then rolling that uh, across a corporation is something that we're noticing. And definitely, we, I agree with you, we see in our clients, they prove the concept at a pilot and, and are able to roll it out across their plants. Well, good. Roy, uh, a final one I'm just going to sneak in that someone was just also asking about where they can go for additional information. So if you don't mind showing one more moment on that slide, um, obviously we're just scratching the surface here. <laughs> and. Um, I really do appreciate the amount of interaction, but I do want to hold us to the hour. So I would like to thank Roy for putting this together and for all of our listeners today and taking time out in your participation. And uh, again, our goal is to uh, bring you topics that not, we not only think are important, but you do as well. So please take a moment when we conclude the webinar and. Um, Give us a survey, let us know how you do, and if you have additional questions, please pose them and we'll get them to the right people to get you answers. So thanks again for everybody and thank you, Roy. Um, I'll see you next month at Accelerate and thanks to all of our listeners. I hope to see you on another webinar or at Accel Accelerate next month as well. Thank have you, a Rona. great day to all. You bet. We'll Take see care. you soon. Bye-bye.